Hi, and welcome to The Nutrition Pediatrician, the channel that delivers science-based nutrition advice for today's parents. I'm your host, Tom Flass. I'm a pediatric physician board certified in pediatrics and pediatric gastroenterology, a father of two, and a lifelong nutrition nerd with two degrees in human nutrition and 30 years of nutrition experience that are recently condensed into a book called Feeding Our Children. My mission is to improve the health of our children using the power of nutrition starting in pregnancy and early childhood. In each episode, we're going to break down a hot topic in nutrition and give you useful, actionable information. By helping parents, teachers, and healthcare providers make more informed food choices, we can create happier, healthier, smarter kids. As a disclaimer, these episodes are for educational purposes only and do not constitute a physician-patient relationship or medical advice. Always consult your physician or primary provider with any health-related questions you may have. Thanks for joining me, and now on to today's episode episode of the Nutrition Pediatrician. Uh, this week, we are going to continue on talking about pregnancy nutrition, and we're going to be focusing on optimizing intake of important pregnancy nutrients, with today's focus being on folate, choline, and B12. Just to reiterate, why are those first thousand days so important nutritionally? So we're talking about that period of life between conception and through the end of the second year of life. And they are important. There's sort of three main domains that we focus on in those thousand days that are heavily shaped by maternal and early life nutrition. So the first is that rapid period of brain development. So you really want to be eating nutrients and and feeding that child nutrients that are feeding the brain. The second is that developing all important microbiome or the gut bacteria that are living in that child's intestines and help to control metabolism, brain development, immune system, a whole bunch of really important functions. So we wanna make sure we're feeding the gut, meaning feeding the gut microbiome. And then thirdly, this is also the period of the most rapid and and most intense uh, programming of our genes uh, called epigenetics. And so we wanna feed the genes, meaning we want to uh, provide nutrients and eat a diet that is turning on protective genes and turning off harmful ones. And failure to pay attention to these, uh, these nutrients, these important nutrients in the first thousand days potentially can have severe consequences. And that early diet really helps to shape the health of that child for the rest of their life. So again, we're gonna talk about some of these important first thousand days nutrients, especially in relating how it feeds the brain. And today we're gonna talk about what are called the methyl donor nutrients, which for today's purposes are gonna constitute uh, folate, choline, and B12. B6 is also one of these nutrients, but we're just not gonna focus on that as much today because it's more common in the diet, less commonly deficient. So these so-called methyl donor nutrients, they work together, they're super important, and they help to regulate the genes that what we call epigenetic programming. They are super important for brain development. Um, They also are involved with formation of neurotransmitters, which are the little chemical messengers that our brain uses to send signals. And they're also important for detoxification processes, so getting rid of junk that the body doesn't need and that could be harmful to the body. So first we're gonna start with talking about folate. And this is more on people's radar because of folic acid supplementation. And there's definitely been more of, I guess, a media presence regarding folate over the last 20 years. So folate, super important during pregnancy. Again, it's one of those gene regulators, these epigenetic modifier nutrients, super important for brain development, neurotransmitter formation, also important for detoxification processes. It's also needed for blood formation. And if you are deficient in folate, you can get an anemia different from iron deficiency where you get small cells. This is one where you get large red blood cells, but not enough of them called megaloblastic anemia. It's needed for growth and for DNA formation. So if you picture that growing baby who uh, is replicating a lot of DNA and there's a ton of growth going on, folate is obviously super important for for that. And deficiency for quite a while now has been known to be associated with spina bifida, which is also referred to as neural tube defects and also congenital heart defects. And deficiency was much more common before the era of food fortification with folic acid that I believe started in the 90s. Um, And the RDA during pregnancy is about 600 micrograms, which is a bit higher than uh, non-pregnancy, which is about 400 micrograms. So we're going to talk about something called MTHFR, which is not a bad word. Uh, It stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And what this is, this is an enzyme that activates folate in the body. So whether you're getting most kind of 
garden variety dietary folate or the folic acid that's uh, uh, fortified in foods or in supplements, your body can't use that. It has to activate it. And the, one of the key enzymes that does this is this MTHFR. And so some people carry genes that code for a somewhat defective MTHFR enzyme. So you really aren't as efficient in activating that folate to its usable form. And this could potentially cause problems. So if you want to nerd out for a second, the specific genes, if you do something like 23andMe that sometimes are reported, there's one called a C677T and another one called an A1298C. And these are the two main ones that have been focused on in the research. And again, if you have especially two copies of these genes, these um, somewhat defective MTHFR genes, it makes it harder for the body to use folate or folic acid efficiently. So mothers who have two copies of this gene are known to have doubled the risk of having a child with spina bifida, also increased risk of having a child with congenital heart disease. Um, and so these mothers may benefit from either a higher dietary intake of folate or folic acid um, or uh, potentially taking this active form of folate, which is called either 5-methyl-THF or L-methylfolate. This bypasses the rate limiting step. And so you can actually find this form of, of folate in liver, in eggs, but also some prenatals are starting to incorporate it as well. And this may become important for the moms that have uh, two copies of these genes and are, are much less efficient at converting things over, just bypass that rate limiting step and actually take the nutrient that the body needs and the baby needs. And it's uh, thought that right now about 25% of moms of Hispanic descent, about 20% of moms of Italian descent, and 10 to 15% of Caucasians uh, have some of these MTHFR genes that could potentially cause problems. So when we look at folate in the diet, uh, we break down what are some of the high folate foods, things to focus on in the maternal diet to make sure you're getting good folate supply. And so uh, eggs are probably the number one thing because a lot of people like eggs, they're super rich in folate, three eggs a day uh, actually has almost half of, of what your dietary requirements are, not quite half. And it's interesting to note that free range pastured eggs have a higher folate content than commercially raised eggs. Uh, beef liver is probably the most concentrated source. And uh, if it's palatable to a mom, the liver is actually almost like a prenatal vitamin onto itself because it's so nutrient dense. Lentils are surprisingly high in folate, so that can be a good source. Everybody always thinks of the greens, and they are a good source, spinach especially, and some of the other leafy greens, um, broccoli and Brussels sprouts, avocado, uh, and rich cereals and grains, which actually don't have natural folate, but these are the foods that are often supplemented with folic acid. It also is worth noting that processing and prolonged heat reduces the folate level significantly, so cooking vegetables, steaming is really the best way to get the most folate out of those vegetables, and uh, it preserves most of the nutrients in there. So folate supplements, let's talk about that for a second. So a good prenatal should have at least the roughly the RDA 400 to 600 micrograms of folate or folic acid to help prevent deficiency. Again, folic acid is the synthetic version um, that is found in fortified foods and a lot of prenatal supplements. And it's definitely still helpful to prevent neural tube defects. Uh, it's worth noting that more is not necessarily better. And I would caution against mega dosing, mean, meaning taking anything over a thousand micrograms unless specifically recommended by an OB, because uh, it appears that uh, the unmetabolized synthetic folic acid may have some negative potential negative effects. And so that's still being worked out. So uh, really 400 to 600 should be the, the dose. Um, but some prenatals are now containing that methylfolate or um, L-methylfolate or the 5-methyl-THF, um, you know, they're interchangeable, which is more readily used by the body, does not build up in any sort of toxic level, um, and you shouldn't need as high amounts because it's, it's, it doesn't need to be converted. It's already in its active form. So now let's shift over to talk about choline, which is also uh, a super important nutrient that is somewhat underrated. Um, it's another epigenetic modifier, meaning it helps regulate our genes. It's super important for brain development, neurotransmitter formation. It's also a detoxifier. And surprisingly, it is as important for preventing neural tube defects, spina bifida, as folate, but it just sort of doesn't get the airplay. And higher intakes are actually associated with better brain development and cognitive performance years down the line, up to seven years um, of age. And so, unfortunately, most pregnant women are not getting enough choline um, in their diet. So the RDA during pregnancy is about 450 milligrams. 
Um, but some studies out of Cornell were showing that about up to 900 milligrams daily uh, shows a, a long-term potential benefit for the, the baby's brain development. So if we look at choline in foods, you can see it actually takes some work to, to get to the RDA level. So again, liver powerhouse food um, is super concentrated in choline. Eggs are an awesome source. Three, day, three eggs a day is gonna get you almost to the, the RDA level uh, of choline during pregnancy. Um, steak and hamburger, decent sources. Salmon and chicken, decent sources. Not as great in the vegetarian sources. So tofu is a decent source. Quinoa, peas, broccoli, Russell sprouts, baked potato. I'll have some in there, but if you're looking to get to 450, uh, 450 milligrams a day, you might have to do some work to actually get there. So some moms may benefit from a choline supplement. So prenatal vitamins generally don't have that much choline in there um, because it's kind of a bigger molecule. So some are starting to, and I have seen some with several hundred milligrams of choline um, in their, their prenatal vitamin dose, um, but it seems like the majority have far less than this. So mothers who aren't getting a lot of these high choline foods in their diet, I think should consider a supplement. Talk about it with your OB, talk about it with your, your midwife. So choline bitartrate, choline chloride, choline citrate, phosphatidylcholine can all be useful to that growing baby. Uh, and the dosage that's been shown to be safe and used in a lot of these studies, 300 to 500 milligrams, and is usually well tolerated. So if we shift over to B12 um, as the last methyl donor nutrient we'll talk about today. So again, another one of these gene regulator nutrients, epigenetic modifier nutrients, super important for brain development, neurotransmitter formation, also for detoxification processes, works with those other vitamins, works with folate B6 uh, and choline. The RDA is much less. It's only 2.6 micrograms per day, which is a pretty small amount. However, there's been some studies recently showing up to 20% of moms worldwide may be somewhat deficient in B12. And low B12 levels during pregnancy have been known to be associated with preterm birth, uh, some of those neural tube defects, again, like spina bifida, um, the, some neurodevelopmental issues. And deficiency is much more common in mothers that are on vegetarian and vegan diets because it's just not found much or if at all in a vegetarian diet. Um, levels can be tested with something um, called a methylmalonic acid level, which goes up when the B12 is low, along with the serum B12 level. And it's also worth noting that the absorption of B12 is inhibited for moms taking an acid blocker, those PPIs, if they have really bad reflux, heartburn, and you're taking one of these acid blockers, you are at increased risk of B12 deficiency. So when we look at food sources, seafood seems to be like the really good, strong source of B12, clams, oysters, sardines, all good sources, salmon, a good source. Beef and lamb, a decent source. Chicken and turkey, a little bit less so. Some in milk, a decent amount if you have the three eggs again. Um, but when you look at vegetarian sources, shiitake mushrooms and purple nori seaweed are about the only vegetarian, uh, vegetable, non-animal source foods that may have some B12 activity. But most of the other foods tested haven't really had much or at all of active, biologically available B12. So I think that makes it important for vegetarians and vegan moms to get their levels tested probably, and also for sure make sure that their uh, prenatal has a decent amount of B12 in it. So most prenatals are at least gonna have the RDE level of B12 in it, uh, and it can come in several forms. So cyanocobalamin, methylcobalamin, adenosylcobalamin are all the main forms. There might be some evidence that the methylcobalamin form is a little bit better absorbed and retained, but all of them have biological activity. All of them uh, will be useful to prevent deficiency. And this is one, I, again, I don't think it's worth mega dosing. Um, somewhat higher doses are generally considered safe, but uh, unless a mom is known to be deficient, I don't think you need to be taking thousands of micrograms. Uh, prenatals may have anywhere from two and a half up to 20 or 30, maybe up to 50 micrograms, which is generally considered safe, but I don't think you need to megadose unless advised by your healthcare uh, provider. Um, so women at increased risk of deficiency maybe consider getting tested. And again, a low serum B12 level coupled with an elevated methylmalonic acid level determines deficiency. There's also a test called a homocysteine level, and homocysteine is a somewhat toxic metabolite in the body that may be associated with things like congenital heart defects and spina bifida. And uh, homocysteine uh, is metabolized and detoxified by the combination of the nutrients we just talked about, choline, B12, B6, folate. So an, an elevated homocysteine level can, can essentially represent uh, a low intake or 
uh, a deficiency in one or several of these methyl donor nutrients. So as far as take home points today, the methyl donor nutrients, the folate, choline, B12, all crucial during pregnancy. Mother should make an effort to incorporate these foods, uh, the foods that are rich in these nutrients every day during pregnancy. A good prenatal will probably have the RDA for folate and B12, but not typically for choline. So mom's not eating a choline-rich diet should think about taking a supplement of 300 to 500 milligrams a day. Mothers with a family history of spina bifida, congenital heart defects, or known MTHFR variants may be considered using that L-methylfolate version of folic acid and bypassing that, that somewhat defective enzyme. Uh, and just a note, if you eat three eggs with some spinach and avocado daily, that goes a long way to hitting your folate B12 and choline requirements during pregnancy. So if anybody's interested in downloading a pregnancy nutrition guide, it's available for free on my website at thomasflass.com or feedingourchildren.com. If anybody's interested in nerding out, uh, this slide contains a lot of the references I used uh, in the pregnancy chapter in my book, Feeding Our Children. And otherwise, thanks for joining me and we will see you next time.